thank you, Peter. Thank you uh, to the New Culture Forum. Thank you to all of you for coming along today. And thank you uh, to Ben for that absolutely forensic presentation on the latest uh, numbers. So thank you for that. Um, well, conference, um, we're not supposed to be here. We're not supposed to be having this conversation. I say that because had the vote for Brexit been properly managed, had it been properly understood, uh, then we would be currently living in a very different country with a very different immigration policy. Overall numbers uh, would be coming down. We would have a genuinely high skill migration policy. Uh, we would have control of our national uh, borders and we would have as a self-governing sovereign independent nation uh, judicial independence. We would have the ability to do whatever it takes within the legal framework to control our own national borders. But none of that, as we know, has happened. So here we are debating the politics of immigration. It's now the third top issue for all voters in the country behind the economy and the National Health Service. And last week, for the first time, immigration became the top issue of all issues for all those people who voted Conservative and for Boris Johnson in 2019, which is remarkable. It is more important to many voters in this country than the cost of living crisis, the most severe cost of living crisis for half a century. It is more important to them than the sharpest decline in, in living standards since the Second World War. Um, as I wrote in my uh, Substack last week, um, to which delegates of the conference uh, have a unique discount in the programme, uh, for 2019 Conservatives and all voters in the country, levels of concern about immigration are now rising, not falling, and scepticism about the impact of immigration on the country and public services is rising, not falling. Um, as Ben rightly said, the reality of immigration uh, today is that we actually have the opposite of what our leaders on both the left and the right promised. Uh, I won't rehearse the stats as Ben has done a comprehensive job uh, at uh, outlining them, but instead of lower migration, we have mass immigration. Instead of controlled borders, we no longer have any control really of our borders. And instead of high school migration, we actually have a low-skill migration policy. One point that Ben alluded to but, but did not go into detail on is the salary thresholds for incoming uh, migrant workers are now as low as £23,000. Uh, in some sectors of our economy, the national median wage, in case you don't know, is £33,000. Uh, the salary thresholds make a mockery of the claim that we have a high-skill migration uh, policy. And instead of weaning our political economy and big business off uh, importing cheap migrant labour, off this political economy which has routinely prioritised the interests of big business uh, and the governing class in Westminster, uh, we actually just have more of the same. We have a loosening of uh, visas, we have a loosening of student migration, uh, and we have a loosening of rules around migration in order to essentially maintain the status quo before Brexit, which is why uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies and others have now made the point that has been obvious to many of us for a while that we are now entering uh, into and will likely stay in a low growth, a low productivity, a high debt London centric economy. Uh, there has been no desire among politicians on either the left or the right to stand up to business and there has been no desire to radically reshape our, make, our migration policy. And perhaps the uh, most egregious example of this has been pointed to was Boris Johnson's um, decision to remove the requirement uh, for British uh, companies to advertise jobs uh, in Britain first. Boris Johnson, as I've written extensively, was not 
uh, a conservative. Uh, Boris Johnson actually was in many ways a liberal uh, who was committed to sustaining uh, the broken status quo. So the question that I want to answer, two questions. Firstly, why did this happen? And the second is, what do people think about it? What do they really think about immigration? And as some of you will know, uh, if you've read uh, my recent book, uh, Valley's Voice and Virtue, uh, the failure to respond to public concern on immigration uh, really should be seen within the context of the rise of a new governing class in this country, a new elite uh, that is comprised mainly of elite graduates uh, who live in the cities, the university towns, uh, who tend to come from very privileged family uh, backgrounds and who crucially have been drifting to the cultural left over the last decade, uh, embracing pro-immigration, uh, pro-globalization, uh, pro-diversity, uh, pro-social uh, liberalism as a guiding philosophy uh, of their world view. Uh, the new uh, graduate elite disproportionately dominate the political institutions, the media, the creative industries, the cultural institutions, uh, the museums, the galleries, and effectively determine what is and is not socially acceptable to debate and discuss within the context of our national conversation and the public square. This is not a conspiracy. This is simply what academics would call education polarization, where the elite graduate class, especially since the vote for Brexit and the vote for Donald Trump, have moved sharply to the cultural left on these questions, largely to try and uh, project their sense of uh, moral uh, righteousness and to disassociate themselves from voters who did support things like Brexit and Donald Trump. And non-graduates have either stayed where they are or have drifted uh, rightwards on these issues. And so what we are living through, as the Home Secretary alluded to in Manchester, where I, was, where I was a few days ago, is not just the rise of a new governing class, but the rise of uh, what some academics like Rob Henderson at Cambridge, um, and, and I've also written about, is the rise of a luxury belief class. Uh, a new elite that is essentially um, committed to advocating ideas and beliefs which win them social status, esteem, and honor from other members of the elite class, which, which often have very few costs uh, to them and their families, but which impose very high costs on other groups in society. And mass migration is the classic example of that. Contrary to what economists told us in the 1990s, that globalization and migration would lift all boats, the consensus is now actually quite different. Uh, the consensus is that both of those uh, broad shifts have imposed uh, disproportionately negative effects on working class voters and non-graduates in Western economies. Uh, David Orta, David Dawn and others uh, in economics have shown this now consistently. Tony Blair was wrong in 2005 when he derided anybody who criticized this new regime as essentially being uh, uh, closed-minded and as people who did not understand the reality of uh, mass migration and globalization. Um, and we know that this new regime has disproportionately benefited uh, the very members of the new graduate class who live in the big cities and the university towns. And so the continual advocacy of mass migration, of weaker national borders, um, of uh, endless uh, churn and population change and diversity is not only um, reflecting this new moral hierarchy in society where the new elite are projecting their values, are projecting their beliefs to other members of the elite in order to win social status for themselves, but is also reflecting their very real economic and cultural interests because this system is working much better for some groups in society than others. And so what the uh, Democrat pollster David Shaw, who worked with Barack Obama, has pointed out, what we are living through is the great awakening uh, of our elite class, which is uh, a, a governing class that has latched onto radical progressivism, radical woke progressivism, to essentially disassociate itself from other, from other groups in society. And this elite class has also latched on to, especially since Brexit, two misleading narratives about immigration that I just want to try and challenge. Um, the first is that what we are uh, really living through is the liberalization of British society. 
So if you spend any time on Twitter, like I do, you will often come across this narrative that's promoted by academics, think tankers and pollsters, which essentially says the following. Yes, Britain might have voted for Brexit, but actually forget all of that because what we're living through is the liberalization of British society. The British people have actually fallen in love with migration. They have become increasingly positive about migration and therefore we don't really need to be having a conference like this because everybody is basically getting with the program. Okay, that is uh, one narrative. And if you would like an example of this, David Gork and other um, conservatives uh, have written about this in their new book, The Case for the Centre Right, supported by lots of um, pollsters who made the same argument, interestingly, before Brexit, uh, which is that Britain is rapidly becoming more liberal. And of course, this is what Jonathan Rauch and others have talked about as the rise of a new epistemic class, which is projecting its values on the national conversation which is essentially um, misinterpreting empirical data in order to align with their existing beliefs, which is one reason why I also now do my own polling because I'm so suspicious uh, of much of the polling that is done. Um, and this, um, this narrative of liberalization is incredibly misleading when you look at the reality of what people think about immigration. And those of you, uh, who, who do engage with some of my work know this, but let me just give you a few numbers drawn from the latest uh, polling and surveys um, in this country. And remember, the dominant view is anybody who's concerned about this issue represents a fringe minority who wants to return to the 1950s. 50% 50 of British people think that a sustainable asylum policy in this country is not possible if, as Suella Braverman suggested, simply being gay, female, or fearing discrimination is sufficient to qualify for asylum. 51% of all voters in this country support the Rwanda scheme. 51%. As, by the way, does the National Crime Agency, which has pointed out that the only thing that will work in tackling the small boats is not, as Labour suggested recently, smashing the gangs, but is having an active deterrent uh, in a third country. 52% uh, of all voters in this country think that we should remove illegal migrants from the country the moment they arrive. 52% say we should have tighter immigration restrictions. 52% say they want to see levels of immigration reduced. 54% say the current rate of net migration at 600,000 plus is too high. 57% say our illegal migration policy is too soft. 57% say they have no confidence that government can fix the small boat crisis. 58% say that the country has already lost control of its borders. 58% say that the illegal migrants crossing in the small boats in the channel are already demonstrating contempt for British laws. 60% say that we should prioritise British workers over migrant workers. 66% think, like Suella Braverman, who had an interesting reaction in the media after her recent speech, uh, agree with the Home Secretary that uncontrolled and illegal migration represents an existential challenge to the West. 66% of all voters, two-thirds of the country, agree with that suggestion. 69% think illegal migration has put unsustainable pressure on the British taxpayer. One thing that Ben was right to point out is that we are now spending £4 billion a year on our broken asylum system which, by the way, is more than we are spending on levelling up all of Northern England. Seven, Seventy percent, seven in ten voters, think that the government talks a good game on immigration but needs to act. Eighty-four percent think immigration has been managed badly over the last ten years. The point that I'm making, ladies and gentlemen, is that this room does not represent a fringe minority. This room represents more than half of the country, if not a vast majority of voters in this country. And if you ask uh, the voters whether, for example, uh, we should be allowing uh, European courts and judges to influence decisions uh, that are made in Britain about uh, Britain's borders, uh, just 14% of voters think uh, that they should. 
Just 14% of voters think that things like the European Convention on Human Rights or judges and courts in Strasbourg should be having any influence over our national borders. And the growing scepticism that I mentioned is reflected in the fact that if you ask voters how do they feel immigration is impacting the country, uh, today only one in five voters, 20%, feel that immigration has been mostly good for the country. So Brexit and the aftermath of Brexit, the way that I always view it, has been a wasted opportunity. Uh, Brexit ushered in a once-in-a-lifetime chance to reform the migration system and to respond to these very intense levels of public concern over both the pace and the scale of demographic change in this country. It would have been very straightforward to respond to that. One of the second misleading arguments is that much of what we are discussing today is inevitable that you cannot exert control over global shifts. This is also, as Ben and his colleagues repeatedly show, deeply misleading. Everything we are discussing today represents very deliberate and specific political choices that were taken by either the New Labour or the Conservative governments. Everything that Ben listed on his slide reflected a very specific decision that was taken in Westminster and Whitehall. So the argument that we cannot change the status quo is ridiculous. We could raise the salary thresholds considerably. We could change the international student migration uh, in a far more comprehensive way than is currently being suggested. We could change the, sh the shortage occupation list and what is included on, on that. We could revisit and reform our relationship with the European Convention on Human Rights. We could reform the Human Rights Act. We could ensure that we have sufficient judicial independence to have a third party deterrent scheme like Rwanda, which the National Crime Agency and many of my colleagues in Australia would say is the only thing that would actually stop people from risking their lives by crossing the channel in boats. Those are a different set of political choices that could be made. But what worries me the most conference about everything that we're talking about today is actually not the level of concern that I see every week in polling and surveys and when I'm sitting in focus groups with voters who are to be frank, bewildered and disillusioned when it comes to this issue. What concerns me more than anything today, and the reason I've become increasingly outspoken on this issue, is the complete collapse of public confidence in the system to regain control over any of this. The Times newspaper recently ran a story where it said that the public no longer back the Conservative Party on immigration because they back the Labour Party on immigration. Um, technically, that is true. More people do say they trust the Labour Party than the Conservative Party. But the vast majority of voters in this country say they do not back any of the big parties on this issue or they don't know who to back on this issue. The level of disillusionment out there in the country when it comes to migration, a top three issue, is palpable. And the reason I'm concerned about that is because the lesson of the last two decades, and indeed much of, much of Europe is, is, is witnessing this at the moment, the message of the last two decades is that when public confidence in immigration collapses, public distrust in the entire system uh, begins to increase very sharply. And this is exactly what we saw in the late 2000s and the early 2010s, as voters increasingly looked at the changes New Labour had brought in, looked at David Cameron's refusal to deliver meaningful reductions, and lost faith in the entire system. And the end result of all of that was heightened political polarisation, was distrust in politics, distrust in our fellow citizens, and a weaker social fabric. And what infuriates me more than anything is the complete failure of our political elites to learn the lesson of the last 20 years, to actually deliver meaningful control so we can have a stronger asylum and immigration system, so we can have a stronger politics, so we can have a stronger democracy and we can have a political class that is more responsive 
to the thoughts, the aspirations, the wishes and the desires of ordinary British people. Thank you very much. <laughs>
is happening in television programs. They're looking at the messages at the museums and the galleries. They're looking at what their children are being taught in schools and universities. And they can sense increasingly that they are being subjected to a political and cultural project which is being imposed on them from above and which is not respecting or recognizing their worldview. That is essentially uh, how millions of people in the country feel. So the importance of building and cultivating and supporting an alternative ecosystem, one in which pushes back against this cultural consensus, this elite consensus, is the second thing that actually we can do. And that means supporting alternative countercultural voices. It means promoting alternative think tanks and channels. It means actively contributing to disseminating an alternative belief system, an alternative worldview, or in, I would argue, in my case, simply reporting empirical data as it actually is. Okay, and you know, everybody, you know, everybody brings their own beliefs and ideological prize into this debate. We are all here because we have strong views about a particular issue, so let's not kid ourselves. But when the search for truth becomes hijacked so brazenly by ideology within the big institutions in the country, we all have to push back as hard as we can, because if we don't, that will then become the homogenous worldview and it will be, you will simply not be able to dislodge it. So events like this, the little platoons, the counterculture is where it begins. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> I just wonder whether uh, it's more of a point of information, really, that politicians who do push back against these things, for example, the Danish immigration minister who ended up being prosecuted and wearing a tag because she did her job too well, and the former prime minister of Italy who was prosecuted for kidnapping because he wouldn't allow NGO boats to dock in Italy. This is the type of thing you're up against. And I think, you know, people aren't always aware of what's gone on. And, I, you know, I can't imagine anybody here having the courage to, to actually carry on and, and wind up in court. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Matt. Um, my question is, given the polling um, in favour of tighter controls on migration, and also the dire straits the Tories seem to be in in terms of their own polling going into the next election, why are the Tories failing to take action on this? Is it a deliberate choice? And if so, what's at the heart of that choice? Because they don't believe in it. Um, the Conservative Party is not seriously interested in immigration reduction. Uh, the Parliamentary Party is either too culturally liberal uh, or is more culturally liberal than its voters, particularly its post-2019 voters and its activist base, um, or is too preoccupied with social status that it does not really want to get engaged in these cultural issues. I mean, so weak are British Tories that they have allowed a large chunk of their own territory from history to identity, to national security, to borders, to sex-based rights, to the rights of our children, free speech, to be repackaged as toxic, divisive culture wars. That is the weakness of conservatives today. They have not even put up a fight to say, <clears throat> they have not even put up a fight to say that these things are actually not toxic. They are the foundation of who we are. They are the foundation of our civilization. So, unfortunately, the British Conservatives have checked out of the argument, and partly that is, I think, thirdly due to the donor class that surrounds the party. If you look at the immense pressure that came down on Boris Johnson and others not to reform the broken relationship between business and importing cheap labour, we had one large employer after another saying, look, we're going to need to liberalize the system, we're gonna to need to increase the shortage occupation list, we're gonna need these people for the NHS. Whereas the reality, is, the reality over the last 20 years is that we have consistently underinvested 
in British kids and British people. And the greatest example of that is, by the way, the National Health Service, where instead of increasing the number of medical school places for British kids to become doctors and nurses and surgeons and so on, our leaders simply found it easier to import people from abroad because it was cheaper and often import people who, are not, who were not as well qualified as their British counterparts. And that, again, was a deliberate political choice that was made because much of the establishment is addicted to importing cheap migrant labor. It is a short-term fix for much longer-term, deep-rooted problems in our national economy. And if Rishi Sunak was serious about saying, I'm taking the long-term decisions, he would be spending as much time, as Peter said, talking about legal immigration and how that system is being used to conceal a broken model of higher education, right, where international students are being used to conceal the, the glaring financial problems in our universities, is being used to conceal our productivity problem, is being used to drive consumption in an economy that doesn't make anything anymore, that doesn't produce anything anymore, and is being used to satisfy the sense of moral righteousness and virtue signaling of the elite class, but doesn't really have much of an interest in anybody else in the country. So I think that the Conservatives, you know, simply do not believe in the things that they have been saying to the rest of the country, which is why they're only holding half of those 2019 Conservatives, because to be blunt, people are not idiots. They can see it. Okay. Thank you. Matthew Weber, thank you for a great speech. Um, something I noticed about those percentages is they were very similar to the, the yes vote for Brexit, you know, that, that 52, 53%. Um, I was involved in campaigning, you know, for the, you know, the leave vote. And what I actually noticed is that there was a lot more engagement, you know, on cert in certain council wards where the, um, you know, sort of like turnout was, was ridiculously low. It was, you know, you know, people were queuing out in the rain, to, you know, to cast their vote. I think you've talked about this in your book, that actually there's a lot of, um, the, the real winner of what's currently happening is apathy. What one takeaway or what couple of takeaways would you give to people like us? Because we're energized, but how do you actually, what, what I fear is, is that like you said, there's going to be a slow drift to this sort of like double thing. What, you know, yes, you have the alternative ecosystems, but what, what can we do? That's, well, one of the uh, reasons Brexit was pushed over the line, which we tend to forget, is because about two and a half million people who don't usually participate in politics came to vote for Brexit. They sensed that there was this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reform the system, to shake up the system. Uh, those people, many of those people, alongside 2019 Conservatives, are now saying they do not plan on voting at the election next year, I would suggest because they feel that that opportunity has been missed and that nobody is really interested in making much of a change. I think beyond strengthening this ecosystem, which really is critically important, if you look at any successful social movement in history, even during the dark days when they've struggled to hold things together, if you look, you look at the literature on the women's rights movement, or the environmental movement, or the nuclear disarmament movement. What has been critically important has been sustaining and holding together an alternative ecosystem and disseminating ideas to new people. That is foundational, but I think beyond that, it is also most likely going to come to a point where we are considering things like electoral reform and political reform of the institutions. I have personally come to the view that first past the post is an unsustainable position for this country because it maintains a duopoly of the two parties and those parties are refusing to change to meet much of the rest of the country. Now, that comes with risks. If you're a conservative, proportional representation over the longer term delivers more left-wing governments and right-wing governments, right? That's, that is the reality of PR. But I think if you're thinking about, you know, how can you reform the institutions, politics, and the national conversation so more people feel that they have a voice, that's one thing. And the other thing is more devolution. 
Send power down. Send power down to towns, to communities, to regions. Take leveling up seriously so we're not just pushing out government departments, but we're redistributing economic and cultural and political power. That's what leveling up was supposed to be about. Why is that important? Because then you are re-establishing the principle of popular sovereignty. You are re-establishing the principle of the sovereignty of the people and asserting their control over institutions which have become too centralized, too homogenous, too inward-looking, too self-serving, and to be frank, too disinterested in the rest of the country. So those are the sorts of things we should be, I think, pushing for over the next few years. Thank you. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free, just remember, to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.